Okay, so yeah, I'm I'm Gabriel, and um, I want to talk for a bit about uh, pulling data out of the ether somewhere and uh, trying to uh, incorporate it into our pipelines. Um, I'll start um, by saying that I haven't. This isn't the sort of thing I've sat down and thought systematically about and put a series of our packages together. Uh, it's what I've come across as a, a jobbing health economist solutions I found along the way to a bunch of related problems that I thought it, it was worth talking about. So just to talk about the, the motivation here, there's, there's a couple of things uh, in my mind here. The first is that uh, data that are useful to health economists like me are increasingly available to us from uh, increasingly accessible sources. So this white paper that came out half a dozen years ago makes this uh, explicit commitment to removing barriers to effective data use and making APIs available to, to make that all seamless. Um, uh, I'll whisper it, but I think this might be one of those little occasions where there's the not entirely malign influence of Dominic Cummins. On, uh, on UK government. Um, but so yeah, there's that commitment and there's uh, a similar uh, a similar attitude in uh, within the NHS itself. And you can find these uh, peons to open data out there. So we know that the data sources we use are, are, are increasingly available to us. And the other driver is about if we're going to try and make our open source pieces of analysis, then we want that to be replicable and we want it to work on uh, on other people's computers. Um, it's this common problem of uh, having a, a bit of data available somewhere that might not be um, immediately available at the target computer. Um, and even worse than this kind of situation, um, that uh, Jenny Bryan was calling out, you sometimes get uh, people uh, providing pieces of code and saying, right, for this to work, you need to go and download this data set here and put it there and then tell the piece of code where it's pointing at. And I think we can all agree that that's um, uh, a recipe for error and it's a recipe for people and not being bothered to use your code. So um, I'm going to walk through my little... Um, typology of the kinds of external data I've pulled into a pipeline while doing analyses in R, and they're in a sort of um, uh, a uh, subjective and a decreasing order, of, of, of in increasing order of painfulness uh, to implement as I go. So the easiest thing you can have is a package which hooks up with an API that does what you want it to do. Um, uh, Nicholas, Nicola talked to us earlier about the World, World Bank querying package that you can just plug in, you learn the syntax and it works. So here's an example of that. Um, the ONS ha has its API system, Gnomis, one of its API systems, um, for which there's a package available, Gnomis R, which is part of the R open side collaboration. Uh, and that's got a core function called Gnomis get data. Uh, which you learn your way around, and here's my code for that, where I'm uh, just uh, 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 feeding it some simple uh, parameters of what I want to get out. Some of it is in a bit of gobbledygook that I've had to go away on the website and, and look up. Um, if I was using this a lot, maybe I'd wrap it in a function of my own that makes that a bit more user-friendly, but I've I've learned what I, I want to do here. The, um, uh, the particular... Uh, application I, I have in mind with this is uh, is trying to find out uh, what proportion of deaths in the uh, ONS data are, are, are due to cardiovascular disease. So I write that query and um, it brings me back some data. Uh, I might want to wrangle that data a bit because it's got 46 columns, the first six of which appear to be the date. Um, and uh, so, yeah, tidy that up a bit, and I've got a, a, a data frame I can do something with. And in this instance, here's my proportion of people who um, die of cardiovascular disease over time. Okay, so that's the easy story. I think the second most easy uh, version is when there's an API serving data 
there isn't a package available, but you can relatively simply access it, um, especially if it's served in a, a JSON format um, using a package like JSON-like. So my, my example of this is um, prescribing data from the NHS Open Data Portal. There's a, a bunch of different prescribing data sets in there. Um, some people uh, I'm sure will be familiar with the prescription cost analysis. I'm going to look at an example here that uses the English prescribing data set, which um, uh, some people uh, will recognize from like um, uh, Ben Goldacre's MOBS um, open prescribing interface that you, uh, that you can query. Um, so if we want to get at that um, via JSON Lite, uh, what I've got here is um, the underlying uh, URL of the API. Um, and in this case, I've, uh, I've appended to it the fact it's going to ex expect some SQL from me. So I've, I've just put that together. This is a slightly, um, um, slightly more com complicated SQL query than some others, because I'm asking it to do a bit of aggregation on the server side and bring me back some summary stats. But then I just paste those two together, use the handy little URL encode function from, I think, BASAR, um, and that pulls that into that long string, which is just um, going to go off for me and return the JSON if I use from JSON from JSON from JSON Lite. And then um, I can pull the, the results out of uh, the list of lists of lists that um, that's returned and look at that. And here's my data that, um, that is served to me in a, a really, relatively convenient way. Because um, I want to do that repeatedly, then it becomes relatively trivial to make that functional and just uh, set up this function where I'm pointing at a data set and uh, the time frame I'm interested in. And, and I've broken up the different components of an, of an SQL query there. Um, so that uh, that can be done in a, a functional way. So here, that's exactly the same um, uh, query I had before, just broken up and fed into my function with the various parameters I want. Um, but that really comes into its own when you want to be able to do things uh, more repeatedly. So in this instance, what I've done is uh, set up a table of um, a bunch of rows of things I'm interested in, which is basically one per month over a, a long period. That, that table looks like this. So I've got one row per month, um, uh, which only varies in the year and month. Uh, but then I can feed that into the, um, what is the per map um, functions, which um, I'm sure many of you will know as sort of the tidyverse equivalent of the apply functions um, in, in BASAR. And that means it will go away and do that call 111 times and bind the results back together and give me a big table in, in, in this case of um, 20,000 uh, records over those years. And uh, that's a picture of, of what I got out of it from some diabetes prescribing data. So one level more difficult than that, um, trying to read uh, Excel workbooks that are archived somewhere on the internet, but that, that, that can be relatively trivial. Um, the uh, ONS life tables are an example that I'm sure almost everyone in this room will be familiar with, um, where you can go and download a, 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 an Excel spreadsheet containing um, uh, data on life expectation over years and years. Um, I'm, I'm sure loads of people know this spreadsheet well. Um, and it's obviously relatively trivial to, um, to go and find that. So just telling, uh, telling R where it is and using HTTR get to bring it down and write it to a temp file and then being able to read it um, via um, read Excel is on the face of it simple. Um, that will bring me back a, a rather ugly data set, which takes a bit of wrangling, um, uh, not least because it's come out of an Excel spreadsheet and it doesn't start with the first line and there are repeated column headings and those sorts of things. Um, but with a bit of work, we can we can turn it into a nice tidy data frame. Easy. Um, feeding that into a, a, a function, don't worry, I'm not going to talk through all this. Um, is a way of making that a bit more flexible so that we can go off and find the life table we're interested in according to 
uh, the geograph geography of interest or the period of interest and do some other uh, bits along the way. Um, and that enables me to do things like plot. This is the life expectation of 60 year old women um, over the period from 2000 to the, the present each day. Um, and you can see it getting better over time. The worst thing um, that, I've, uh, that I've dealt with uh, along this way is um, where you have these convolute, convoluted systems of CSVs within ZIPs, within ZIPs, and the best example of that is um, what used to be called the National, uh, the NHS Reference Costs, it's now called the National Cost Collection. So um, if you go to that website, it will give you the, the current data. I'm, I should say I'm, I'm looking here at the organization level raw data that's available for all these. I've got another function to just pull out the schedules from the spreadsheet that everyone knows, and that can, um, that's on the GitHub um, repository. I'll, I'll show you at the end here. Um, but here I'm interested in the, the raw data files. Um, so it will give you those and it will point you to where you can find them archived on another website. And you go to that website and it points you to another website where even older ones are archived. And actually there's one further website where, where they're archived. So pulling all those in um, is a, a pain in the neck. So you get those, um, uh, th these functions here are uh, designed to pull those all together. Uh, just to highlight a couple of things along the way in the wrangling of that you need to say so like one year the currency code uh, variable had a typo in it and it's called currency code and it took me a long time to find that that was the error I have um, but uh, just correcting that and then similarly the way codes have changed over the years this is just a small uh, proportion of them where I, I get them to translate into their modern day equivalents for example um, but using the exactly the same trick I showed you before um, where I set up a table of everything I'm interested in here, in this case, 15 rows, one row for each year of where it's going to find the data, what the CSV file is called and where it might have to go into a sub zip to find it. Feeding that to, to uh, a per map function enables us to bring back, in this case, 22 million lines of data, um, which is an astonishingly rich um, data set, which, as far as I'm aware, almost no one has ever looked at. Um, the, the master's student of York, students of York didn't want to look at it for a, a placement this summer, I can tell you that. Um, so, um, but it's, I, I think it's, uh, it, 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 we should be doing more analysis on this. Uh, here's a model I've fitted to um, some caesarean section costs. Um, and here's uh, the proportion of, uh, of births by caesarean section. One interesting thing here, this line at the bottom, slightly outlying much fewer caesareans than anyone else. That uh, line there is um, Shrewsbury and Telford NHS Trust, which had got into lots of um, trouble over the last decade for its substandard obstetric outcomes. Actually, you can, you can see that for years, its, it's rates of um, cesarean sections have been disproportionately low. Um, so um, there's only one thing worse than that, and that's anything in XML. Um, I'm, uh, I'm quickly running out of time, so I'm gonna whip through, why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, so the data, data owner might move the data, then everything breaks. Um, there's a potential example there, you don't get the data. One defense to that is you could archive the data yourself. You can stick them up onto like the Wayback Machine or what have you, which I've done with some of these um, data files, and that means they're there in perpetuity. Um, the data owner might reformat the data. So there's an example of that with SCMD, and I've had to put a cludge into my, into my function to make it look at the various places where those data could be. Um, and um, it, it's hard to predict what would happen under those circumstances. You might get the data, you might not, your code might fail. Or the data owner might change the data. And I think that's the, the most interesting thing in the way. Um, you'd have to have been exceptionally eagle-eyed as I flashed that up to, to, to notice that there's a little note at the bottom saying, by the way, we changed these data after publishing them. Um, and that raises an interesting question. Um, is, if the, everything changes, is that, is that a bug? Suddenly my beautifully replicable um, analysis doesn't replicate. Someone else picks it up and does it uh, cast doubt on the, the, the robustness of my analysis if they don't get the same answer I did? Or is it a feature? 
if things have changed, presumably they've changed for a reason. We want the most up update answer. And, um, and there are evangelists in this room for living HTA in a way that should be responding to uh, those outside uh, changes. Um, I, I guess in the end, the answer depends uh, on, uh, on the exact function for which you want to use those data. I can think of plenty of circumstances under which you want robust um, uh, outputs that aren't going to change and others where uh, that degree of dynamic updating is obviously a benefit. That's me done. Every, everything I've talked about is um, in that, uh, that GitHub repository, um, if anyone would find any of it useful. Thank you very much. We're going to open the floor to questions in person. Um, thank you. That's a really interesting um, talk. Um, now that I've been converted to the R package man, um, I was wondering, um, you know, you're right, there's a lot of those data sources that, you know, all of us working in UK um, economic valuation use again and again. Is it worth kind of having a get to UK health econ data package? which could utilize kind of all the work that you've done and, and kind of ease future sort of pulling from these different data sources. Um, so I would be enthusiastic about that. Um, I'm not sure I'd be enthusiastic about doing the work, um, but uh, yeah, it would be an obvious extension. I, I think one of the things I'm quite conscious of within this is if that would take active maintaining in that, um, just preparing for this talk, I've had to update bits of code because things I was looking for have moved or broken. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's an ever present danger. Um, hopefully that danger goes away a little bit as, um, as APIs become more commonly, uh, become the more common route for serving those kinds of data. Um, and hopefully the producers of those APIs, if, if they know they're getting lots of calls from a particular package, would, would be cognizant of how they could break everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it would take a lot of maintaining for now, uh, but maybe that's an investment worth making and it's certainly one that should bear fruit in the future. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned right at the start, I don't know if it's a white paper, but a government document around making data accessible. Are you aware of particular kind of organs of government which are making this happen and making Dominic Cummings' dream a reality? One of his <laughs> We wouldn't want to make all of Dominic Cummings' dreams. Um, uh, not I, I think it is coming into the the health health and care service. There, there's there's clearly stuff happening with NHSBA um, and NHS Digital where they're, they're, they're trying to make um, stuff available. I think obviously that's an arcane labyrinth of, uh, of different organizations. Um, and I think the, the rate limiting factor on that is, is more about organization than will. Uh, so, so those, you know, um, the, those spreadsheets from uh, from the reference costs and whatever have been available for years and years and years going back to when you had to get a CD of them. Um, and so they're, they're always keen to make the, those data available. Whether they join up in a way that makes it easy for us to get at might be another question. So time for one last question. We've got Nathan um hi um can you just say something about the metadata do you download information about you know, like is there like a standard template of the metadata in and across all of these data sets and so you could use the information in that when you're doing the cleaning yeah. so no is the answer okay. um there isn't and some of that's that's quite difficult so um some of those APIs will give you a in, in amongst those lists, there's a there's a bunch of metadata that you can use to understand where the data are within it and um and how you might be able to get hold of them. 
some of them I, I found it very difficult to, to find anything. So that pledge I put in for my um, uh, my open prescribing thing to get the SM, SCMD data, um, I couldn't find a way of getting that API to serve to me which of the three possible names is going to be attached to this data set. So I wrote a bit of code to try the three and serve back the one that works. Um, it would be great if there, if you could just go off and, and get the metadata, which would tell you that in, in the first place. Um, there is some joining up of, uh, so I've done some work with like um, Dictionary of Medicines and Devices data, um, which are horrible to access in, in R because it's all in XML. Um, but uh, yeah, the use of like SNOMED codes across those sources, um, and like the BNF data and, and others um, does begin to make those join up, um, but that's that's not painless. For the most part. So, are you interested?